Good morning, everybody. How are we today? Good, good. Uh, of course, uh, Lisa said it, you know, Paul Rodrigue. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I started blowing glass in 1993. Um, so that brings me up to almost 30 years now of glass blowing. As a business, uh, I t studied at Sheridan College. So I. That was a three-year program, so I've been about 26, 27 years in business, uh, full-time or pursuing it, you know, uh, as, as my passion and uh, livelihood. So uh, I'll show you some slides. It's, a, it's kind of a go-through of, of what I've done over the years, and the order is somewhat in there, but then it might get a bit mixed up too. So. Uh, I'll be happy to answer some questions uh, throughout, or if you see something, you, you know, we can stop and take a look at it and talk about it. Um, and I'll just kind of keep going, you, you know. I got to change the slides manually, so every now and then I'm going to dip on you and, and that. So um, here we go. Uh, the first slide is it basically as I get into my work, I love color. You know, um, glass is one of the um, it's so much in our lives that you, you don't take for granted in the windows out here and our windshields in the cars, the uh, glass on the buildings, but yet you can still take this medium and make beautiful art with it. And the colors, the way it highlights colors is unlike almost any other medium out there. It's like the, it, it captures the light. You know, I, I always say Mother Nature is really the best color artist out there. Um, but second to none, it, you know, it's glass for sure. So um, this is, you know, I don't do a lot of these pieces, but I love the color swirl patterns in them. And sometimes when I do these talks, it gives me an opportunity to review what I've done over all these years. And sometimes I want to go back and sometimes I want to re-explore some things. And while I was putting this together, um, I saw this and I thought, yeah, you know, I should go back and make some more of those because it really exemplifies the fluidity of the glass and the, the, the element of surprise is amazing, yet, you know. So I just choose the colors and I, I do the magic with the glass and I drop it in a mold and then it, it, the way they lay down and the way they overlap, um, you know, even the little bubbles are beautiful. So, yeah, you know. Um, okay. So born and raised, well, I'm born in Burlington, um, raised as Hamilton, Burlington, same thing to me. Um, you, you know, so I had the opportunity with the Hamilton Arts Council to do this project, which was kind of neat to, uh, to see myself. There was about 40 artists they chose and they put us all up on lamp posts down the, um, that, not James Street, but what, the same one that they, um, the playhouse is on, um, yeah, King Williams, that's it. So, and there was a few other ones. So that was really neat. Uh, so here goes my story. Here I am, I was living in Whistler. Um, even though, you know, you grew up in this area, you want to get away from it a little bit before you come, end up coming back. So uh, I traveled, I, I, you know, I moved out to Whistler and I was skiing and snowboarding and went to see a lot of concerts and, and all that stuff out there. Um, and then one day I saw a video on TV and it was Dale Chihuly. Do you all know who Dale Chihuly is? So he's like the Picasso of glass. He, he's enabled many, many, many of us to uh, pursue glass as a career. Before he came along, you know, glass blowing was, was very popular, but he, he is the rock star of glass. So, so I saw one of his videos and I was blown away. I was late for work that day. Um, and then I got, kind of slipped away from it, went back to my daily routine and, and, uh, and that. And then all of a sudden in the mail one day, I got the Sheridan College book. And on the front it said, hint, hint, Paul. So my mom had sent that out to me. Um, and, and it sat there for a little bit and I started flipping through it. And my dad was a woodworker and I had a good friend who was a potter. So. You know, I saw glass, or uh, I saw woodwork, and I thought, oh, you know, dad and stuff like that. I saw clay, um, and I thought, okay, yeah, you know, that's what Eva did. And, and uh, then I flipped it, and it was glass blowing. So I, I was like, that was that stuff I saw on TV. I got all excited, and, and yeah, you know. So I applied to school blindly. I was always artistic growing up. Um, 
I failed grade 11 art, but I think it was because I never did my homework versus, you know, not being good at it. Um, and oddly enough, when that teacher retired, uh, they came to me to buy him a retirement gift. <laughs> so, so that was always kind of neat. Um, but I got accepted, so I moved back home, I cashed it all in, and I started glass blowing. Um, and you know, my very first piece was, was you know, I'd, I've never looked back basically since then. Um, I actually, funny story, I sold my very first piece for $10 to my neighbor Art, and um, he thought it would be a great gift for his wife Sylvia. So about five years later, once I'd finished the program and you know, I realized I gave away my first, first art piece. I sold it for $10. I thought, this is gonna be good. You know, it's gonna work out. Um, so I went back to art five years later. And I was like, hey Art, do you still have that piece? And I explained to him, well, I ended up making him this giant centerpiece table, like, yeah, you know, for my tiny little paperweight and that. So, and I still pick it up every now and then. And I criticized the pot, and I'm like, I'd never polish glass that good anymore, yeah, you know. So, so, you know, over the years, this would be shared in college. This would be the Living Art Center in Mississauga. Um, and then this is Glenn Williams, a few of the studios that I worked out of long term. I was also a Harborfront resident down in Toronto. You can be there for up to three years. Um, and then you have to move on from there. Uh, you know, it's for uh, emerging artists and stuff like that. But it really helped me build a foundation for my career. So uh, this was one of my third year graduation pieces and this one as well, but it's a very bad slide. You know, we had used slides back then and you, you know. Um, but the overlap, which you can't see in this, is that with the blue over here, and this beautiful, the blue went amber when looking through the back of the red. So I, I, I did this eclipsing windows of glass and I kind of stumbled upon it, um, but I fell in love with the process. And it's not, a, uh, it's not an easy process. It takes a long time. It's not just to gather up the glass, blow it out, and boom, you've got a vase. We have to layer the colors. We have to um, you know, set them all up. Um, this series, I sort of, you know, I'd carve the lips on them to, to bounce the light around and stuff like that. Um, and I, I kind of just kept pursuing this idea. Um, and then one, one, you know, through a couple pieces, I kind of, or through these, I went to the primary colors and I started getting some real magic happening with these sort of elements of surprise over here. Um, those, those to me are what I search for in my glass. You know, you know the element of surprise and I eclipse these wind colors that um, when you overlap and see them, uh, you know, you get these colors that I can't, I can't buy this color, this magenta in the glass. So I, I kind of create it through the techniques uh, and the overlapping. Each one of these pieces I start individually. So I start with the the blue, and then this is a r ruby red up top here that you can't really see, but it's ruby, maybe a little more in there. Uh, and then I make the centerpiece, and then I bring all the components together in a technique called incalmo, which in Italian means to weld one body of glass to another. Um, <clears throat> and so the technique is, is very old. They've, you know, they've been doing it since probably the 1800s, even there. Um, but, but, you know, to modernize it, add the colors together, and then to twist the glass is something that they never really got into too much. Um, and that, so, <clears throat> so I kept kind of pursuing these, these pieces, and I, um, as I got it into, you know, finding out, you know, nicer color patterns or ways to lay them down, I tried, like, the teardrop shape really lent itself to opening up a wider canvas. Um, on them instead of, you know, although I do play with the forms once in a while, back then I was all about these wider teardrop shapes and then bringing the front to the back by squishing the glass with two pieces of cork. Um, and, you, you know, glass blowing is a really romantic process to watch being done. It's hypnotizing, the heat is there, the roar of the furnaces. Um, it's quite something to sort of see um, so, so again, you know, uh, what's interesting about this, so right now we're probably talking, uh, 
late 19, no, I think we're into the early 2000s here, um, if you wanted a timeline. So, but uh, there's something unique about this one, and it's this sort of piece here with the little squiggle on the top. So I, as I got tired of the teardrop shapes, or exhausted them maybe, not so much tired, um, I wanted something more out of the glass, something to represent the lines and the fluidity and the bands of light. So I, I wanted to start playing with the glass more, using its qualities like the viscosity of the glass. Um, you know, to get a nice teardrop shape, I got to blow it and shape it and drop the glass. And I'm, it's, it's very methodical, but it's, it's also difficult. Um, and you, you control the material more. When I switched to this sort of form, I could spin the glass and let it go wide and I grab it point and I pull it out and it, it's, it's more fast action which might apply itself to a little bit my, more of my personality um, and that. So uh, I th this is again sort of the teardrops in that same era um, and stuff. So this was one of the sort of the last ones. Um, then in tw 2005, um, did anybody know or, or know Cheryl Takis or Shirley Alford when I say those names? Okay. So I, I worked with Shirley for, for 16 years. Um, she kind of mentored me. I'm very big on mentorships, especially in the arts, because it's so hard to make a living and how to develop a business. Um, and then so Cheryl was her partner for a long time, but they branched out and then so Cheryl, I actually bought Cheryl Taxis studio from her in 2005 up in Greensville. Um, and then I've been going there ever since. So this would have been 2005 when I first got there. Um, <clears throat> and yet, you know, it's awesome working around other artists, but glassblowing is, it's, it's tricky because, you know, sometimes you got to make a lot of volume and, and if you have other artists around you, um, so you got to walk around them. You got to be careful. Some people, you got to walk in eggshells around. Glassblowing is a very, you know, everybody's got their personalities. So I, my dream was always to have my own studio and I, it would be my space and, and, uh, and stuff. But it's a, it's been a, it's, it's a difficult life, not difficult, I'd say it's a challenging life. You gotta be up for it, you gotta have the energy, you gotta make the work, finish the work, you gotta get the work out to the galleries. Um, I do a lot of corporate work. Uh, I do have some smaller signature pieces that um, you, you know I make. So I make these hummingbirds, I always say, um, it, you know, I probably wouldn't have been able to get to my own studio if it wasn't for the hummingbirds. I still make them, I still enjoy making them. Um, you know, and then it's not too long in my new space, I got invited to participate in a uh, public, in, or this is a, in a building called the Power Stream building, it's at Major McKenzie in 400, um, and this is with a glass architect, uh, Gordon Wright, and so I was the glass maker, he designed it, he was a glass guy himself, um, and that, but, uh, so the Power Stream building, they deal with a lot of energy, so, Basically, we went after those insulators that you see, um, different styles and ones. I think it's about 140 different pieces of glass. You can see the larger scale installation of it. This piece here is probably about 30 inches round. Uh, and he kind of gave me, with the plates, he kind of gave me carte blanche to do whatever uh, I wanted to. He just said, make them colorful and have some fun. So that was really good. Um, and it was a really nice project and amazing to see. Uh, shortly after that, I did a, uh, with these pieces, I did a Canyon Creek restaurant um, uh, by the airport and they recently just changed it over. So my glass is somewhere, I'm not sure what they did with it. Uh, I do know one of the managers there. So they said it was safe and they were repurposing it or something like that. So that was kind of neat. Um, you know, the beautiful thing about glass, though, is that it's, you can sculpt it, you can blow it, you can do all these things. And, and the majority of the pieces that I make are blown and stuff like that. But I had the opportunity to, uh, to partake in an exhibition and do something different. So these are uh, some bunny rabbits, of course. This is time, money, and on the run. Um, 
so uh, I don't know if any of you know Pink Floyd. <laughs> so that, it was kind of inspired by that. Um, but it, it shows you the livelihood of, of the, the glass. And these are all, I, I would maybe kind of self portraits. You know, I, I always want to like the thumbs up with the money. When I, anybody gets paid, you're always really happy and, and stuff like that. So, so it's really nice to branch out and do, uh, do those things. So this is also, this is the next slide here is taking my, my Encomo technique and then spinning them out into platters. Um, you know, to get a, a plate and glass, basically you make a bowl and then you spin it out and zoom, 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 really fast um, and stuff. So, so this is a different way to display them as well. And you still get these, these elements of surprise in there, which are pretty wild. Um, I do really like making those, you, you know. Uh, this here is a little bit later, but it, it, it shows that, you know, these ref the refractive light that glass represents, the diffusion of the colors are, um, I set the colors up so they, they can diffuse like that. And, you, you know, but I'm still blown away every time I kind of, when I see these, these I, I've made posters of them, almost the size of the, blackboard there and those are always really nice as a print um, and that so uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. okay so these are more of the the magentas so a buddy of mine worked for Kia Canada and asked me to make the national dealer gifts for them in 2010 um, and you know these pieces take a long time to make each one is is about two hours, you know, two and a half hours of glass blowing to um, to get to to the end result of the piece. Um, so, and I asked them, well, how many do you want? Well, they wanted two hundred and seventy-five of them, and I only had about two months to make them. Um, so, of course, I said yes. <laughs> yeah, you know. And I was at the studio firing up. So, you know, when, we, when I get to the shop and I fire up uh, the glory holes, the reheating ovens take a bit of time to heat up. So, yeah, you know, I was getting there at about 4.35 in the morning. We'd start glass blowing by 6.37. Uh, we'd work till about 8 o'clock at night. Um, but we, we made it to the end. Um, and so it, uh, when we made the deal for, for that, my buddy at Jack at Kia, um, offered me the car of my choice. Um, so the, I, and they, you know, they took care of the taxes for it and everything like that. So that was kind of a really cool, uh, thing to happen to me. I went into the dealership. I paid 36 bucks <laughs> for the plates and I drove away with uh, a 20. I'm still driving that car today. I got 275,000 miles on it. <laughs> Um, but it, t it looks as good today as it de does then. So, so you know. Um, okay. So let's see. Here we are. More than that same. You can see I've evolved a bit in my shop. I think we're getting up to around 2015 here, maybe 16. Um, over the years, you you know, I I've had many people work for me now. I once was the apprentice or the you know the the young. Buck getting yeah, sh shown the ropes and, and stuff like that. Uh, now I, the tables have turned. Now I do a lot of the men mentoring. And uh, when I bring people in, they work for me for a couple of years and then they usually move on to, to continue their business. Um, if you have any of you watched Blown Away yet on Netflix? No. Okay. So Blown Away is filmed in Hamilton here. Um, and it's like forged in fire. It's a glass blowing contest. There's three seasons of it. Um, most of the assistants that have, are on that program have worked for me uh, for a, at some point over the years and stuff like that. So um, let's see. So the, you know, cha always changing my color palettes. Um, this is actually stepping. This is almost where I'm at now. Again, I'm, I'm starting to step back with my pieces, not try, 
trying not to be so busy with my colors and and you know sometimes the, like the uh, they're very quilt work like or tartan those those colors that I get um, but you know I do like to branch out from there uh, when I can and change the forms up uh, yeah you know so that's sort of what these pieces are about here um, and that so care we never we never set up the uh, the video, the YouTube one. Uh, so I had it on my computer. If you bring it up on your browser, it should play. Oh. The sound might be not super bad, but. Okay. Let me see. Uh, in my the browser on the in the or maybe I could just do this. As I keep talking, I can go back to here. Da, 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 da. Um, come on now. Where are we? OK, so I can keep talking while that comes up. OK, so again, this was another great opportunity to just have, have fun with some glass. And again, sort of uh, this was also done with Gordon Wright. Um, this is a community center in Kitchener. Uh, and he calls these the, well, we called them the Kingsdale ra Rounders, or Rondells, sorry, the Kingsdale Rondells. Um, and the idea of this was that, you, you know, the community center, lots of kids come in and, and you would get splashed with color and playfulness of the plates. And the, uh, um, you know, no pl two plates are the same. Basically, I tried to make sure of that. That was one of our goals, that every plate had its own individual sort of color and um, pattern. Uh, in my gallery over here, or this is my, my large gallery at the shop. It's very small, 10 by 10. It's my old one of a kind show booth, actually. Um, you know, but you know, the joy of being in my own studio and then just playing with some, some black and white colors and some glass blowing techniques. Um, of course, yeah, you know, uh, I've, though the, the colors and things that I do are so dominant and I make these pieces and people take them home um, into their environments and, and admire them and yet, you know, um, I still see clients 5, 10, 15 years later and they're still like, Paul, we love your piece still. So, so that's all, always reassuring. But with the tattoo, I, I, I wanted something that represented my artwork, but I also wanted the artist who was going to do the tattooing um, to, to just create something with looking at my photos and then I'll wear that. So it's kind of like her piece of art. So it's on my shoulder here and I, I still look at it. And I always tell myself that I'm going to make that shape one day. And I, I haven't yet, but I have an exhibition coming up in March and I, it's on my mind. It's if I can try to pull it off, then I might. Patience is, you, you know, it took me... Um, uh, 10 years to get, 11 years to get into my own studio. You know, I, I always climbed every step of the ladder and my dad was always like, patience. Since I was 13, Paul, patience, patience, patience. So the patience is like, you know, you'll get there. You just have to be patient. It's a bit of an ode to my father as well because he always just drilled that into me. I'd get mad and, oh, I want my own studio now. And, and yeah, you know, um, and I got there eventually. So in my spare time, although I don't get to do much of this anymore, I still like to play some music and fish, uh, play hockey. I, I sing some songs on a guitar. Maybe next time I'll bring a guitar with me. Um, yeah, you know. Um, and then this is still just kind of playing with glass, and this is still my technique that I do. But yeah, you know, um, it's nice to. It's funny because I don't have a lot of glass at home. But what I do take from home, I bring back to the studio. So this is my uh, living room at home with all the plants. And yet, yet you know, I've gone back to the studio and, and created this piece that sort of, you know, kind of brings the two together type of thing. Um, let's see, I try to keep a pretty clean studio. So, you know, we walk, hose the floors and glass blowing is a nasty uh, material, not unlike like when you're mixing glazes, you have the silicas and, the, and that. So I make sure the dust is minimal in my studio. We hose it down often. We sweep. We, we keep it really clean because, um, yeah, you know, even the, the dust on the floor can get into your lungs. And the bags of the batch I use say, you know, caution can cause cancer. I've lost friends that are glass blowers. Shirley Alford passed from, from cancer. 
Um, you, you know, so I try to keep a pretty clean uh, business. These are just some more of um, you, you know my shapes. This piece here is probably about 30 inches tall, uh, maybe even a bit taller. So if you imagine that at the end of a blowpipe, yeah, you know um, it gets pretty heavy. And we always one thing that you, you know um, I, I picked out with when we watched the video is we work in teams a lot. I can't make this work without the help that I have. Um, and the success rate of it, you, you know, the, I, I really count on my team when we're making these pieces and stuff. The hummingbirds I can sculpt out on my own and we, you know, you know that's my own sort of personal journey with those things. But when it comes to these type of pieces, it's, it's all within the help, you, you know. Um, there's lots of going back and forth, reheating the glass. Yeah, and these are just some more samples of it. This piece here is probably 30 inches tall by, you know, maybe four, 14 or 15 wide. But again, these intersecting ribbons of light and the refractive qualities. You can see these little points here. That those are, that's from just the, the bands of light crossing and the refractive quality that glass has, you know, bending light basically um, and that. So. Um, you know, this was an installation I did at um, the, and you've seen a few versions of these pieces. This was for something down at the Art Gallery of Hamilton. They have the art sales down there once in a while or twice a year, I think. Um, again, this is kind of a platter. Um, me playing some guitar in the sunset because I do love the those, you know. Um, and then this is one of my bread and butter pieces that I make a lot of. <laughs> we make a lot of snowmen at the shop. Actually, this year I didn't really do my Christmas as much as I usually do. I kind of backed off a little bit. But, uh, you know, on a good year, we probably make about three, 350 snowmen to 400. I send them out east, uh, out west, down south to Florida. Um, and, yeah, you know, they've also evolved over the years. Uh, once in a while I play with them. It's a snowman on the beach. Uh, I've done drunken snowmen, uh, yeah, you know, so, and I put a bottle of booze in their hand and, uh, you know, make them all kind of um, playful like that. These are just some dragons. Now, you know, with, with this type of, you know, image, you can see the malleability of the glass or how, how you can sculpt it. Each one of these little attachments are individual um, bits that are brought to me while I sculpt the glass and you could coil it up and pinch it and, and do all these things. Traditionally these were uh, in goblet stems uh, that the Italians would do like dragon stem goblets. I decided to make ornaments out of them for, for a while. I don't do too many of these now but, but uh, you know I always like seeing them in that so. Um, and one thing you, you you know, as we've kind of looked through these slides, um, you can see a little bit of the quality of the, the line that I keep and the pieces and the detail. Like, e they've gotten cleaner and cleaner over the years. So it's kind of one of the, th the craftsmanship and the more you do something. Um, I get upset when there's kind of, when I run into bubbles or issues like that. I really strive for these ultra clean clean ve vessels um, and that. And the shapes have evolved. They're a little bit cleaner, maybe a bit softer. Um, again, yeah, you know, the, this, is, uh, this was a lighting project that I did for a space uh, down in New Jersey. Uh, we had to make 40, 45 of these big globes. Yeah, you know, it's the same one that we're working on here. Hearing that, but you know, doing lighting is a whole different beast. Like with glass blowing, you got to open the tops and the bottom, and you do that kind of in the cold process. Um, there is a good amount of loss on those because it's just when you cut the glass open. Um, I have another project right now that I'm, I'm continuously sort of. They call me every couple months to be like, Paul, we broke a, one of the gas lights. So we'll see those in a couple seconds. Uh, the piece on the right was a centerpiece for uh, a woman's table, very large table with a backlit window. So, yeah, you know, um, that's where a lot of my pieces find their homes as centerpieces or on tables and uh, that. So, this more of the forms, maybe a couple images over again, playing with different designs. 
Uh, this was another centerpiece of a table. But you know, uh, the difference with this one is that I'm using opaque colors. Um, and I do have a fondness for them as well. It's really hard to get to everything that I, I want to in glass. The studio is this beast that costs a lot of money. And I, like, I, I kind of have to, or I'm stuck in that process of like, I got to make this, it's got to be a good piece so I can get it to a gallery, it's going to sell, and then I can pay my gas bill. <laughs> So, so the joy of, uh, I wish uh, we, you, you know, there was lots of money there so I could just create whatever I, I dream up, even if, if it took me five times, but you, you know, um, I really got to trust my, make sure the glass that I make works and we'll, we'll get to a gallery and, and move. So then that way, you know, although I'm, I'm in this process now, after all these years that I'm, I'm starting to take those chances, if that makes any sense. It's like I've always dreamed of this. I have drawings that are 15, 20 years old that I've never tried to execute. And then now I'm actually finding those drawings and being like, okay, I want to try to make that. Yeah, you know, so, so it takes time. Um, these are just some more windows of light um, and that. So I often also in my business, which I, I get people who come to me with these ideas and then I have to kind of facilitate them, which is exciting, but you know, it pushes me in a new direction. Uh, sometimes I have to learn how to sculpt the glass versus blow it. So, you know, we all know Tager. Uh, Tager was about this big. And, um, you, you know, I, I, I kind of was lucky enough to get him first try, which was cool. The, the lines on him are all sandblasted and etched afterwards, uh, but he was a lot of fun to make and, and that. And so, f you know, if you imagine that molten quality of glass and then, you know, through visual, like mental um, imagination and articulation, you know, I can sculpt the glass into these things. Um, so the plunge over here was a woman who was a diver and she kept having, she was a diver when she was young and then she kept having these reoccurring dreams of, of her diving. So she came to me and uh, each figure is probably about six to seven inches. Yeah, you know, so I have a lot of fun doing that because again, it pushes me into different areas with the glass and I have to learn and adapt how to sculpt it. Um, yeah, you know, but she was very pleased with, I was very pleased with the outcome uh, of it. I, it took me a little while to troubleshoot the figures, how I would get them to hang and stuff, but I was able to put a little loop on, on the backs of each one. So that was kind of neat. Um, <clears throat> I've also done quite a few memorials. Um, ashes or remains in glass or something that's very popular now. Um, the, 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 the remains, they fit in the glass, like the yeah, you know, it's almost like an ash. So um, they're able to settle into the body of the glass. And, and they're, um, you can't, well, this one, you can sort of see the white flecks in here. Those would be the remains. So, uh, and I've done some tough ones. You know, the, the skateboarder was a, a young fella, 20 years old, who, who had committed suicide. So that was, tough to do. Um, sometimes I get a bit happier ones, even though passing is not easy. Um, this was a, an elderly couple. The, it was her daughter who had the remains of her parents and she wanted them put back together in a piece. So the pink is the mother and then the, the blue is, was her dad. So to get, and that one was pretty large. So yeah, you know, um, I do a lot of awards and trophies, so these are just a variety of those, um, you know, and again, it gives me time, uh, the opportunity to create different um, forms in glass and, and play with color in different ways. Uh, I etch in the glass and I can write all that type of stuff. Uh, this was a... a centerpiece for another table in the opaques reminded me of a, a deck of playing cards like the queen of i think i called it the the queen of diamonds or the something like that I, it's um i've donated a lot over the years these are uh, bob kemp hospice pieces i've worked with them for 10 15 years now do you make the hearts? uh i do make the hearts yeah oh, i used to work there oh okay very cool yeah 
Yeah, so now I work with uh, the villa over here as well a little bit. So, um, so these were more some sculptural pieces. Um, the Avro Arrow, that was for uh, an aviation club and the president was leaving. So somebody, they came to me and the, the, the Avro, it was a fairly large plane, you know, it took a few tries to get it. Um, I had to spin plates out and then cut the wings out of the plate put them in the kiln and then pick them up hot. And uh, so I love all these kind of challenges that allows me to, to, to play with glass in different ways. Um, the hands holding the Zen symbol on a mountaintop or that's what that sort of supposed to emulate was uh, a lot of fun as well. So, um, you, you know, so this is, let's see me and my shop again. I think this was get making a large platter for uh, these are just some more memorials. The birds actually were, I just made those birds at Christmas time and that was for um, uh, actually a dear friend of mine. She worked at Mac um, and before she passed, she asked to uh, have some remains made and stuff. So her daughter is down in Florida and her daughter wanted something to keep in her pocket. So um, the idea of the birds in the nest, uh, so she could bring a bird in the nest down to Florida when she goes out. She puts the birds, I made sure the bird didn't have any sharp points on it. The purple one on the right there, so she could keep the bird in her pocket and when she gets home, she could put it in the, the nest and stuff, so. And then th these are just some other samples. Um, and these are some different forms, you know, I, I get um, making the same type of forms over and over again. I'm still, I still get excited from them and I love pulling the glass and stretching them and and you know, it's again, it's still about the element of surprise. Like, you know, even I love when the sunlight comes through them and you get these bonus colors and the reflection of uh, the light passing through the glass. Um, in 2015, um, I was lucky enough to have uh, the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, Elizabeth Doddswell, purchase one of my pieces to give to the Queen of England. Um, so that was very cool uh, and I went and did my research and um, you know, the, uh, it's amazing what you can find on Google, right? So um, I found out that the Queen's top four favorite colors or three favorite colors were purple, blue and you know, it gives you the percentage of time she, she wore them. Um, and so when Elizabeth, so I made that piece and, uh, and you can imagine the Queen has so many gifts, right? So. Um, uh, according to Elizabeth, when they were, uh, not Elizabeth, well, Elizabeth Doddswell, sorry, the Lieutenant Governor, when they were unwrapping the piece, the Queen kind of waddled over and was like, oh, what do you, what's that? And so Elizabeth Doddswell said, yeah, you know, well, this is what we're presenting you today. It's a Canadian artist. And, um, you, you know, we figured instead of an award type, we'd give you a piece of art. Well, the Queen was like, oh, that's lovely. I know just where I'm going to put that. So, so that's kind of a pretty cool um, accolade. Um, and so, and although she's passed, to have a piece in Windsor Castle, because that's where she lives, um, yeah, you know, was a pretty neat uh, opportunity to have. So uh, once in a while we go back to Sheridan and we have these glass blowing gatherings, yeah, you know. Um, it's funny, because when I went to Sheridan, I, I actually took pottery for a semester as well. And you know, the potters are very collected people, collect, like, yeah, they're, they're methodical, collected. Um, they have, they like to have potlucks and, and they get together and talk about the work they make and their glazes and, and stuff. Glass blowers get together to group and we all run amok. Like, so we have these parties and we, yeah, you know, um, this is a, a glass, glass gathering at uh, Sheridan College and this, this was the Glass Olympics uh, several years ago but we had a lot of fun and I was the director of the team, I was the Dale Chihuly. So I have a patch on the other side which you can, can see and you know we made these crazy sculptures and, and that and so. Um, so as we kind of go through these, how's everybody doing? Good? Yeah? Am I stalling? Am I, do you want me to keep going? We want to do some questions? I, I got some more slides, you know. <laughs> All right, I just wanted to check in. I feel it's always good to uh, 
come back down and see. So, yeah, you know, um, this is a piece I love because it sort of shows the magnitude of the glass. That's about a basketball size worth of glass. Um, they get very heavy. You can see the smoke a little bit coming from the, uh, the newspaper that I use there. Um, and that. So this was at the Carnegie um, in 2017, I think. Uh, the same piece at the Sandra Ainsley Gallery in Toronto, which was different. So you could, one of the objectives was to try and get this shadow from the pieces, which you can see over here. So you can see, I titled that piece Migration because it kind of has that sort of, you know, group uh, moving, moving from one place to another. Um, over the years, I've played with the line work of the, the pieces. This is a technique called latticino or cane working. Um, and it does give you this element, uh, a new element, a little bit more architecturally and visually. It kind of distorts the light a little bit more. Um, I do really like those, but I kind of, it somewhat takes away sometimes from the colors that overlap, but yet technically wise, it challenges me to kind of keep it in that continuity, keep it clean, keep it visually appealing. Uh, let's see, this is in a, here. I got married in 2017. Um, you know, our daughter Brooklyn was born in 2016. We, uh, we had a really nice time. That was up in Waterdown and, um, and that. Just a little bit more about my personal life. Uh, some more of these pieces. So there's, I definitely have color combos that I go back to and play with more. Um, I don't stray too much from the jewel tones. Um, the blue piece there is a little bit more of a monochromatic, just blues on blues. Um, trying to see what I can get. Um, you know, this is, the, I guess over the years, the twists that I've done with the glass uh, have evolved and gotten a bit more aggressive and tighter. You can see with this piece, adding, adding more elements of color to them. Um, back into some line work. Oh, so, so my slide presentation was a little bit old, a little bit new and stuff like that. I didn't have a ton of time to edit it, but I don't think you'll mind this one. That's my daughter. She's already an artist. She, um, you know, she's six now, um, and that, so she, uh, we saw that one. So I didn't get the, to, to finish it the way I wanted to, but we're gonna get through that. Um, so this is a newer piece that I've gone to. So I still go do workshops when I can. Um, I went down to Corning, New York this year, or last year in August, I got a scholarship to, um, to go do a workshop with an American artist, Nancy Callan, and a an, uh, really renowned Australian artist, Mel Douglas. They work together in teams. And uh, this, it was, I hadn't taken a workshop or a class in a long time, and it was very uh, moving for me. Not so much, gla well, glass knowledge I did take away a fair bit, but also, um, and this is where I'm sort of starting to get into a, a new phase is that uh, making responsible art, um, not just collect, you know, I, in the past I would get to, the, and with all the pieces almost that you see, I get to the studio, I'm like, okay, today I'm gonna use blue, red, purple, and let's go. Yeah, you know, now since I've taken that class, I've actually gone back to some pen and paper um, there's, I'm, I'm taking some steps back, which, you know, that other two color piece, the yellow and um, green one that you saw earlier that was just frosted and it was just a nice shape and color. I, 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 I'm really fond of that, like the transition in it. So I've, I've um, and a new way to, to work the lines into the glass. So this piece, you know, I drew on paper several times and and it's moving away from the tips of the glass. So now I'm just looking at a nice sculptural shape that's pleasing to the eye. Um, and I'm looking at still at the, the transitions of color, but it's not so sharp and bright and in your face. It's more uh, subtle and it's, it's a little more peaceful, yeah, you know? Um, 
and stuff. So I have an exhibition coming up in, down in Florida in St. Petersburg. It's a Canadian exhibition with about seven of us. Um, so I'm kind of getting ready for that right now and this piece will be going down there. Um, oh my God, this piece is a, a whack of, of, of stuff in here. So you can see there's some overlap. One, one cool project, you saw the gas light there. Um, Town of Pelham has about 20 of these, um, you know, outdoor, uh, not like lamp posts, you, you know, gas lights. They're the traditional kind with the flame in them. They've been breaking lately, so they came to me to, to make them. And I, you know, I have this big mold made. We just made a couple of them yesterday. Uh, and it's kind of exciting to make those, you, you know, um, especially blowing the glass into really big two-part molds and, and that. Uh, it can get pretty exciting. I'm sorry, that was a slide I didn't get to, you know, I throw them all on an image and then I draw them out and kind of place them, but stuff. But just sort of moving to this one, you asked about some recycled glass and how it, what I do with some of those pieces. Well, you can see this is one of the line pieces that I'd made, so I kept on to that. Uh, these are probably some trimmings or open ends. Uh, the middle is the DVSA class, probably from, uh, well, during COVID or, or just after. Um, we're all wearing masks there. And then um, the piece on the end is an award that I had made. I did some tourism awards for Saska uh, city of Saskatchewan, or not Saskatchewan, where was it? Anyways. Um, and so I decided to make some larger pieces like that because I like the, the result and effect and, uh, and that. So uh, back to some snowmen. And this was one of my clients who kind of took, took this and she, you know, because she gave them to all her staff and stuff like that, she put the message on there, strength through differences, you know. Um, so I always feel that's always nice to stop and think about. Um, so you can see here, so these, the, the women in film and television, I've been doing those uh, for over 20 years now. That's one of my sort of higher profile jobs that I, I still really look forward to every year. Um, this year, Sarah Pauly got one um, from the Road to Avonlea. And then uh, uh, there's been, Jeannie Becker has one of those and, and stuff like that. So it's kind of neat. Um, I have a video, a short, another video in a second. I think maybe the next slide. This was me down in Florida in 2018. So that's where I'm going back to. It's the Duncan McClellan Gallery in St. Petersburg, Florida. Probably one of Florida's, you know, there are galleries that are just strictly glass. So it's an all glass gallery. Um, so that'll be a lot of fun. And then, so these are the angels, or we call them the crystals, sorry. Uh, a little bit of a recap. These are where some newer pieces, just, you know, trying to work the lines even cleaner. Um, but the light really distorts them in the refraction of the light. And then, um, so I was on a long-term project that I, I, the last couple years, um, it's, it'll be erected in um, sometime springtime. Uh, down at Pier 6, 7, and 8. So it took up two years of my time. Um, and we made 8,000 of these round beads. Um, so we finished that in September. Uh, I, I wanted to talk today more about, you know, myself. And it's, it's nice because uh, I'm just getting back into my style of pieces uh, again. You know, for a year, well, almost two years, I didn't make any of my work. Um, so I'm kind of getting my feet wet again. Um, and so this piece, the next one here is, is the last one. Um, this is for uh, somebody down in Florida as well. Um, and it, you know, so, so this is actually warm in the kiln right now. I had to pull it out of the kiln at about 250 degrees. So you had to put gloves on to hold it. And I took a quick picture of it and I put it back in the kiln, but, um, it was nice to make that. Yeah, you know, I'm like I said, I'm I'm in a diff. The the long term project made me think about my business a lot and how I've done my glass blowing over the last several well many years. Um, and it, you know, I end up doing all these projects for other people, like awards and uh, all these things, which then I don't get to make my work. 
So I'm really trying to shift now, and I feel like I'm at this point now where if I don't make the things that I want to make for me, that you know maybe I should find something else to to do or, or uh, yeah you know. So I'm being really picky about the work that I I I take on now, or I'm moving it on to some of the people that have worked for me before. Have people come to me for lighting or anything like that? It's so so I'm at this point now you know this piece was for a woman down in Florida she bought it online and then I had to remake it so I had to try to make it look you know similar to uh, um, the image she bought offline and stuff like that but it was really nice to finally put together a nice clean piece of mine and and uh, and have it work and be successful this one's not that big it's only about 14 inches tall but you know, getting back on track and then having my show down in Florida is really something I'm, I'm trying to, I'm nervous as hell because I, I want to make some new work and do I stay with old work and, and what worked before or do I take a chance and make some new things and, and that. So, so I got about uh, four weeks to figure it out. <laughs> Anybody have any insight? <laughs> Yeah, well, it's hard sometimes because, you know, it, it's, it's like I want to, you, you know, like any process, glass blowing takes that time to discover or, or you need to trial. You know, one of the things I, um, we spoke about in my class down in Corning was like try, making trial pieces. Like don't, you know, and unfortunately, glass blowing, you don't always have that time to make samples and, you know, make this piece small 10 times before I make a really big one and, and stuff like that. So, so I, I'm more of the, uh, the kind of, oh, let's just try and make it. And if it's great, then, you know, we can build off of it. And if not, then we uh, will go back to the drawing board type of thing. So. So that's it. it. I'd be happy to answer some questions if you, you, you know. Um, everybody's welcome to drop into the studio sometime. I have a question. Yeah. Like, to me, it's my problem when you get these designs and so on. But when you were showing us those ones that you kind of called cartons, yeah. it's amazing to me how you can actually get that form in that shape when you're working with something hot. And so vi viscous. That you're making the more clean now, so the sharper lines up. How do you do that? Uh, well, you know, there's glass blowing is all tricks, and each one of those tricks, there's probably about three ways to do that trick. So, you know, over the years, like um, when I used to trim the component and it would pinch the color together, I've learned not to trim the glass and just break the, the edge off so that when that edge opens, it's actually cleaner than having tool marked the color. Um, so, so I, and you know that there's little nuances like keeping your tools. So if I keep my jacks, my jacks are what I, I neck down the piece with. Um, and if they're cold when I use them, They'll still work, but it'll scratch the glass. Even when it's hot, I can, I can um, make imperfections in the glass from sleight of hand. So now I keep all my tools really hot. I make sure that before I neck down anything that's going to be um, you, you know, uh, encased or anything like that, I make sure the tools are hot that I need. And it's like just the presence of mind of, of um, what else? You know, the, the colors that I choose are, you know, there's many, there's a couple different brands of colors in glass blowing, and most of it comes from Germany, um, some from New Zealand, some from the US. Um, and so sometimes it takes a little while to, you know, the aquamarine blue from Reichenbach is so less color, like so less vibrant than the aquamarine from Gafford Color from New Zealand. They do something different to theirs, and I don't know what it is. Now that darn company has gone out of business, or they've sold, to, so I can't get that color anymore, and it's, I'm very angry about it. So now I gotta use the blue that um, 
it's a little muddy, it's or cloudy, it doesn't have that like um, vibrancy that the, the other one does. So sometimes, you know, it's the colors I choose or yeah, the ruby colors. Um, yeah, you know, there's about six different kinds of that cranberry red pink that I use. And, and if I use the one brand in a larger chunk, it's pretty, pretty nice. But the other brand, I have to use a smaller chunk. So maybe the experience over time makes the, you know, I, I've used this color. I've put it in there. I've tried it with that. And my go-to now is this one. Um, and then so I went and can bring all these together and have it be pretty clean. Um, you, you know, I'm, some of the things you can't really see, but see how this line is darker here and it's darker around the band edge. Uh, like I put that in the glass by the way I set up the color. So before when I just sort of make it or do the, some of the early ones, the color would be one even hue. Now when I make my individual components, I make it so it diffuses. So throughout the band of light, um, the edges will be a little bit darker. Um, and you, yeah, you can see it a little bit here. And that, then maybe around here as well. You can see it in the purple for sure. But that, that I actually purposely do uh, when I'm making the piece so that it just adds more of a feature to, to the colors when, uh, when you look at them in that. So any other questions? Would you say set up the colors? Yeah. OK, so, so the next time I do this, I'm going to bring a couple things in because it's difficult to explain. Um, one being color, of course, we always get asked about the color. When, so I make, if you could imagine, uh, we'll, we'll kind of walk through this piece here. So I have purple, a hyacinth purple, uh, fuchsia gold pink, like, or like a ruby in it, and then a, a gold topaz. So those are chunks that are about one inch long and about the size of a toonie round, and I put those in a kiln. I bring that up in temperature, and it's the very first thing I do is um, I make a little collar with a, some color. You saw me pick up the color in the video, uh, and I rolled it on the table. So I'll pick up one of those colors, and then I make a tiny little bowl. Almost, it looks like a candle votive. Uh, and I'll open the top, and I'll shape it, and then I'll, I'll take that, and I put it back in the kiln. And I, it's still hot. So then I'll pick up the, the next color in line. So that would be maybe the purple. Uh, that would be the purple. I started with the pink. Um, and they make that same kind of component again. And I put that in the kiln. So I have two, two rounded bottom components. Now it's time to pick up the gold. So the gold, if I want to pick up the other ones, so I pick up the gold, and instead of making the opening the component up, I open one end of it while the other still stays on the blowpipe. And I go in and I join the, the mouth of the gold piece. So I go back into the kiln and I pick up the, um, the components that are sitting there waiting. And I can only pick up one at a time. So I'll stick the gold to the, it can be either one. The, in this case, I think I picked up the purple first. So I picked up the purple and I fused them all in and then I transfer the piece onto the, the pontiel or the punny, which um, in glass blowing, most things, if you're not aware, are made in, in two parts. So you always, if you're making a vase, you would blow the bottom first and shape the bottom or the base that sits on the table. And then you'd take another an iron with a little spit of glass on it, being the pontiel, um, and you'd stick that to the bottom and you'd break the top off. And then now the piece is on the pontiel, or the punny we call it. Uh, but the top is all rough now. So then I'd finish the top secondly um, and stuff. So I transfer this piece in that same manner, but when I open up the top of the piece, I pick up the third component, which being the other end. And so now I've got, I bring them together in this kind of big egg. Um, and there's no, there's no way at this point that I can blow glass into it. So, um, and the, the bands of, like the join lines are horizontal at that point. So if I was to take it off there, you would get purple, gold, 
pink. Just straight like that. What I do is they call it a switched axis. Um, I switch, I open up a hole on a 45 degree angle or somewhere random on the side of the piece and then I stick a blowpipe to that. Um, so we remove it from the putty that it was on. Now it's back onto a blowpipe. Then I collect more layers of molten glass on top. Um, and then I proceed to make the, the shape or the form. So it's quite the bowl of soup, <laughs> if, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah, you know, most, generally my studio is always open for people to, if you want to come watch them glass blowing it. You know, some days are better than others. Some days I just make the components and then other days we pick them up or I might be making awards or, yeah, yeah, you know. Um, I don't... No, no, they're hollow. I, I do blow into them. So once, um, uh, um, I had another video that I was going to bring, but, uh, you know, a lot of computers, it was on DVD. So, yeah, you know, it's amazing how technology just isn't stopping. Go figure. Um, but yeah, that one showed the process a lot more of me stacking the cups and, and stuff like that. So we, I had it up on, not that what I do is secretive, um, but I did have it up on YouTube for a little while. And then after some time, somebody was like, oh, now I know how to make one of your pieces. So, and surprisingly enough, there's a guy in Sweden who, who he got in touch with me and was like, oh, how do you make your work? And I, I didn't tell him exactly how. I just said, you know, you choose these colors. And I, and, you know, well, sure enough, didn't he post one of his pieces? And I'm like, well, that's basically mine. Like, so, but I don't have time to worry if there's people that kind of, you know, do similar stuff or copy. I, I just, I got to keep making mine, you, you know, just make, yeah, go ahead. So, where the colors end up in pieces like that, do you end up making the colors that you get random surprises? Uh, well, the, a little bit of both. Um, I can choose the windows that I overlap because as they turn in front of me, I'm looking for that zigzag and that's where I'll stop and I'll flatten the glass. Um, so that way I, I can choose where the windows go. Uh, sometimes if there's an imperfection, like a bubble that I couldn't pick out of the glass, although I love bubbles when it comes to these pieces, I you know, not necessarily a fan of them. Um, I might put that bubble on the side of the piece. So then I just, that way you don't see it through the window. There could be a bubble like right over there, but you wouldn't see it. So then it's very much a, well, you know, it, it'll still look really neat. It might not have been my vision, but, and sometimes that's been better. Yeah, you know, I started for a little while before I started on that long-term project. I started putting the zigzags right on the side of the piece so that I was left with more of um, like this sort of tension was on the side of it and these windows were a little bit wider and that those were kind of intriguing to me and, and then yeah, you know I had to put things on hold for a while and and uh, but here I am kind of back and uh, that took us about two hours two and a half hours of, of straight glass blowing, no stopping. Yeah. And actually the middle band, the first middle band I made um, had some schmutz in, in the color. So I actually had to, I, I, I finished it, but I didn't use it. Uh, I went and cut another piece of color, put it in the kiln, came up in temperature, made it over again, and then proceeded to, to make the piece. Yeah. Uh, well, yes. Uh, so when G Shirley Pash, the design of the Junos went to a place in Toronto called Crystal Sensations. Uh, and what they did was they kept the image and they laser etched it inside a, a, a block of glass. It wasn't that pretty. And then they just put it on a piece of wood. Um, but so the, the Junos were like that for maybe eight or nine years and just within the last two years they've gone back to the same design uh, but it's a metal like I know she, she used to have the aluminum structure on the outside um, 
and now the the in, oh, well the inside would be glass. Now it's all in aluminum, I think. So it's actually back to that the the more free flowing. Yeah, it's a lot a lot nicer now for sure. So and I still. You know, I've made lots of angels over the years. I've made angels with flowing hair and wings and praying and, and all that stuff. But Shirley's angels that she would make are still the nicest ones. They're the simplest and the nicest ones. And I still get requests. Well, yeah, about four or five years ago, I made a, about, made a run of them for the Kemp Hospice for an event. And then since then, I kind of just keep them in my repertoire. But I... I do like beside them in my shop. It's it's I have Shirley's motto and her picture. I call them Shirley's angels. So I still kind of make them. And Kelly Lowe was making them for a little while too, but hers were just a bit different. Like yeah, you know. Um, so I still kind of to make those. Yeah, I brought my. I'm in Greensville. Just uh, I'm located in the back of the Grisdale complex. There's the OK Tire up there, so you take King Road here all the way up under the new bridge that took two years to build, <laughs> um, and and keep going straight through the stop signs. Do not take Highway Eight. When after just before you get to Highway Five or Dundas. There's a set of businesses on the right-hand side, and I'm located towards the back. My sign blew down in the snow storm before Christmas, uh, so it's I don't have I haven't don't have it up yet again. But I do have one in my shop in the back. So uh, thank you for having me.